A very good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty director of the StorageX initiative and also a member of the material science and engineering department here at Stanford. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the final um, seminar uh, for the spring quarter. And for today's seminar, we are delighted to focus on one specific material, which is critical for energy storage. Soft materials, uh, namely polymers, um, are critical in today's lithium ion battery technology. It is what the separator is made of. And it is also very important uh, as an inactive material, uh, for example, as binders uh, in the electrodes of lithium ion batteries. But their uses can be really far greater than that. Um, folks in academia and industry are exploring the use of soft material for things such as the solid electrolyte, as active materials, for example, as electrodes, and a host of other processes. Soft material has a very rich history, um, evolving from simple structural material all the way to complex material for electronic systems. And we're really delighted um, to have two of our colleagues uh, from academia and from industry to talk about how polymers and soft materials can be used for next generation energy storage, both for um, those based on lithium ion transportation, but also based on next generation, uh, low cost, uh, long duration storage as well. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, Professor Alberto Saleo from um, my department and also um, uh, Dr. Kevin Wojcik from uh, Blue Current, uh, which is a startup uh, pioneering solid state batteries using polymer materials. So let me get started uh, by inviting Alberto to the stage. Alberto, as I mentioned, is my, my chair uh, in my department um, and, and a great colleague and friend who has been a pioneer um, in the polymer uh, field uh, for more than 20 years. Um, in his early work at Stanford, he really transformed the field uh, of organic electronics by recognizing its use in, in biological applications and also in energy applications um, for, for solar applications. And I'm so thankful that uh, in recent years, he has gotten interested in energy transformation as well, finding no, new uses for um, electronically conducting polymers in applications for energy storage, for electrocatalysis. Uh, it's really a wonderful material that I think has been under-investigated uh, by these fields. Alberto is extremely accomplished in addition to serving as chair of our department. Uh, he is uh, also a fellow of MRS um, and has had many um, impacts on education, research, and so forth. Uh, his awards would be too long to read, uh, but you'll take my word uh, that Alberto is one of the best um, we've got uh, in material science. And Alberto, I'm really delighted to, uh, to have you with us this morning. And Alberto, please tell us about uh, what other uses uh, semiconducting polymer can have that we haven't thought of. Thank you, Will. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, as uh, Will said, I come from the word, uh, world of uh, using polymers for electronics, and uh, recently we've been more and more interested in uh, their energy applications. And so what I want to talk about today is how we're using these conjugated polymers, and uh, we're getting interested in um, energy storage, and in particular, I think they have advantages in the idea of having a circular economy of energy storage. So if you think of uh, wanting everyone wanting to have their electric vehicle and uh, uh, having this technology be more and more widespread, uh, but really batteries are of course a key aspect of it. And what you'd like to have is uh, you'd like to be able to see the cost of batteries go down, uh, the production of batteries uh, go up uh, and their lifetime go up uh, maybe 10 years, 15 years or more. But no matter what, if you think of the car having a battery as sort of this standalone thing, you'll end up with a problem of having at some point a lot of uh, dead batteries sitting somewhere. So it really is important to think of a circular economy of energy storage sort of from the ground up as we want to have more and more electricity uh, as a source of, uh, uh, as a way to store energy as opposed to, uh, as opposed to liquid fuels. So the challenges for recycling currently 
is that uh, current battery technology uh, requires organic electrolytes. Uh, these are hazardous or flammable. Uh, doesn't mean they're, it, they can be recycled, it's just added costs. And, and in the same vein, uh, electrodes are made with materials and binders. Uh, and so if you want to recycle them, you have to separate all that. Again, this is not a fundamental obstacle, but it just adds cost. And when you add cost, you wonder about adoption, right? Adoption might go down if things become too expensive. Um, so what we are attracted by is the idea to having redox additive materials that can be easily recycled, essentially being able to have uh, a material that is the electrode itself without needing any binders. Um, also that they can be extracted using solvents very simply. It's a simple phase material. So maybe you just dissolve it and redeposit or dissolve it and reuse and pur purify and reuse. And also the materials that we're interested in use safe electrolytes that they can use salty water and that makes it easy for uh, um, safety. Um, you know, of course, the trade-off is what is the capacity and I will uh, address that a little bit uh, as well. Uh, but um, as you see, I think we are off to a really interesting start uh, with these conjugated polymers. So, like I said, I come from the world of polymers for microelectronics, and in that case, you only have to transport uh, one type of carrier, and that's the electronic carrier. It turns out for historical reasons that uh, most semiconducting polymers are good at transporting holes. So hole transporting goes uh, along the backbone. Uh, the holes essentially move uh, along the double bonds and the, the single and double bonds along the backbone, and that's sort of fairly well known. And so the innovation here is not so much the fact that we have electronic charge carriers, but because we're looking at electrochemical devices, and in particular uh, batteries, we also want ions to go in and out. And so now we have uh, materials that can also carry uh, ions. And uh, the thing that is new here is that historically, again, conjugated polymers, had side chains that would repel ions or, or sorry, sorry, not be a, um, uh, not be sort of a comfortable home for ions. But uh, Alice Giovanniti and uh, uh, at the time the, the uh, Ian McCulloch group, he's a postdoc now in my group, uh, devised a way to graft side chains that, as you can see here, have oxygen atoms. And in this case, these can be uh, nice uh, homes for ions because they're polar. And uh, if you have a whole transporter, then the ion that naturally will want to go in there to stabilize the extra positive charge is an anion. So if you have uh, charge carriers that are holes, so P-type semiconducting backbone, you will almost automatically be able to, uh, if the side chains can accommodate it, you will be able to accommodate anions in the side chains. And then symmetrically, remember, we want to make a battery. So we need one electrode that uh, carries electrons and one electrode that carries holes. So if you have your electron as a charge carrier, so it's a different type of backbone, uh, then these, the side chains will accommodate pretty naturally a cation. Uh, so what is interesting here is sort of at a higher level is synthetic chemistry is really good at making molecules that don't exist in nature sort of almost by design. And you can see here the motif already, you have the electronic carrier as a backbone, the ionic carrier as a side chains, and so you can see how the two can almost be designed independently and you can match them to get the best performance. Uh, what's scientifically interesting here is that I simplified things greatly. In reality, it's not like that. There is a lot of sort of interactions to some extent you'll see, and that makes the field, I think, really rich scientifically and fascinating. But let's start, if you're not from the field of uh, conjugated polymers, why do conjugated polymers behave as a semiconductor? Um, when you see conjugated polymers, if you're not, in the, from the world of polymers, you'll see a whole bunch of different structures. They will pretty much all have this uh, constant motif, which is an alternation of double and single bonds, and maybe we'll have some heteroatoms, but really it's the alternation of double and single bonds that matters. And if I cut everything else out, the alternation of double and single bonds would be seen in polyacetylene. And what this really means is that every carbon atom is sp2 um, hybridized, and uh, the, S the, the three sp2 orbitals are busy binding to two carbon atoms and one hydrogen atom. And then there is one electron left in a p orbital that's perpendicular to the sp2 orbitals. And that you can think of this as forming a band, right? You have all your p orbitals that are lined up like this. And if they're all lined up that they're all in phase, you get the bottom of the band. If they're all lined up that they're, each one of them is out of phase with its neighbor, you have the top of the band. And then any other com periodic combination will give you a state in between so you can really think of this uh, 
simplifying a lot uh, as a band structure. And because the energy of the bottom of the band and the energy of the top of the band are different, you get a bandwidth and the bandwidth is really um, connected to the resonance integral or to some extent to how much these orbitals overlap. So if you put them closer, they overlap more. If you put them further away, they overlap less. If you start contorting them, they overlap less and so on. Uh, so from the solid state physics point of view, you think of this difference in energy, the bandwidth um, giving rise to dispersion. So you have an effective mass and everything sort of works in the solid state physics uh, picture. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated here because as I told you, if you get some twists and turns, this overlap can change. And this is what uh, I spend a lot of my waking hours thinking about when I think about charge transport and conjugated polymers. So this is the high level of why the backbone of the, how you would design the backbone of the polymers to be electronically conducting, you need to have this alternation of double and single bonds. Um, we're a material scientists, so we like microstructure. I showed you a molecule. What does it look like when you make a film of these materials? Well, it turns out that because of these polar side chains, these polymers swell in um, uh, water, which is the electrolyte of choice for our application here. And so the ion comes in from the electrolyte, the hole comes in from the electrode. If it's an anion, so it'll be compensated by a hole. But you, you should think of this material as a sponge for, ion that, for ions that also contains um, electronic charge carriers. So you can see now the connection to make an electrode for batteries. You can see now that the ions will be able to really penetrate uh, the uh, material in three dimensions. So this, I don't know if I would call it intercalation. It's more like really a penetration of electrolyte and ion. It's the swelling of the electrolyte in the polymer. And the ionic charge density will then affect the electronic charge density. So we like these materials because you get this bulk modulation of the electronic charge density. And stepping back from batteries, I'm hoping that I can convince you that these are just really interesting functional materials. Because if you think of, again, coming from the world of thin film electronics, there you modulate a very, very thin layer of charge carriers near an interface. Now we're actually modulating the bulk of a semiconductor. So for example, if you push ions in and out with a voltage, you can switch the semiconductor from on and off, but not just the interface, you switch the whole semiconductor. So you get a gigantic modulation of, um, of uh, conductivity. Because these materials change colors when they're charged uh, and you, ch you change the color in the bulk, you can also make displays. Electrochromic displays can be made with these materials. Fascinatingly also, uh, when you charge these polymers, they essentially form electrostatic crosslinks so you can actuate them, you can make them more or less rigid. And also because they swell with electrolyte, they change their volume so they can be used as pumps to push things around. So really interesting family of materials as well alluded to. In our case, what we're interested in is the fact that when you modulate the amount of uh, ions, you're changing the amount of electrons. So you're changing the position of the Fermi level. And so if you have two electrodes that have two different Fermi level position, and you connect them, you essentially have an energy storage device. And I think you can argue semantically whether it's a battery or, a, or an electrochemical capacitor. Uh, I don't think I want to get into that, um, into that type of controversy. But the bottom line is you have a device that can store energy. And this is what I want to talk about today. So what are the opportunities and challenges here? Here is a typical material that you'll see a lot. Uh, in this case, this is an electron uh, conductor. And I'm not going to go into the details of the design of the molecule that make an electron conductor. But at a very simple level, you have to think of a molecule that will make electrons uh, comfortable. So it has things on the side that are electron withdrawing so that they decrease the energy level of the electron. So when you stuff an electron in, the material doesn't become unstable. So here is one of the materials you look like, look at, and you can see this alternation of double and single bonds. Uh, this is a perylene diimid um, group, sorry, uh, uh, naphthalene diimid uh, group here. And then you have two thiophenes here. And so this is called a naphtha naphthalene diimid bithiophene molecule. Doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters here is that it can accept two electrons. The monomer can accept two electrons. And the side chains that are polar or glycolated are sitting here. Um, now compare this to graphite, the typical uh, electrode material for lithium ion batteries. And you can see right away, there's a stark difference, which is you need a lot of molecule to accommodate two electrons. In graphite, you only need six uh, atoms to accommodate one electron. The consequence of that is that, of course, the gravimetric capacity of these polymer electrodes is not as high as the gravimetric capacity of your typical uh, graphite electrode. 
Uh, the advantages though, like we said, is that a single phase electrode design, the material is both a conductor of ions and electrons, so you don't need to have a binder that does the electron conductivity or the ion conductivity, a different material. And because the material swells in electrolyte, you can potentially have very fast charging rates. And in fact, we can see that. And, and that's something that I've also been fascinated by. These are materials that conduct ions really well. You don't need to, uh, there's very little mechanical deformation to get the ions in and out. So they, tra they, they transport quite nicely. And then because the material swells in water as an electrolyte, uh, it can operate in, uh, in water as a, as a battery uh, electrode. So what are the strategies to design uh, these materials? Uh, so you want balanced ionic and electronic transport properties. And again, just to simplify, you can think of the electronic transport going along the backbone and the ionic transport going along the side chain. So hey, I can graft any side chain on any backbone. I can design any material I want if I am a skilled synthetic chemist. So for the backbone design, what you need is identifying backbones that can charge, be charged reversibly without side reactions. And I'll talk a little bit about stability, but once you put an electrode, uh, sorry, an electron on this molecule, maybe there is a chemical reaction that happens because you're also in water. So you want to avoid that and you want reversibility so you can have a lot of charging and discharging. The side chains, on the other hand, has to have to be tuned um, so that the polarity is such that they can swell, they can be swelled when they're cycled in aqueous Electrolyte. So I'm showing here a side chain that wouldn't swell and here a side chain that swell. And you can imagine actually mixing and matching them to control a little bit uh, better the properties of the material. This is a really attractive feature of synthetic semiconductors. So for our battery, we have as an anode material, like I said, for the electron side, uh, the, uh, the electron electrode, we use this polymer, we call it P7525. And the 7525, showcases an aspect that is really interesting about these materials is the fact that, like I said, I can sort of mix and match. I can make this material with alkylated side chains and with glycolated side chains. If it's fully alkylated, not good for uh, aqueous electrolyte. If it's fully glycolated, it might be very good for aqueous electrolytes, but maybe charge transport is not so good. Well, it turns out that I don't have to be all or nothing. I can mix 75% monomers and 25% monomers of the other type copolymerize them. Currently, they're copolymerized in a random configuration, but you can imagine a future where you'd have them perfectly regularly copolymerized. And so you can really fine tune um, the level of um, side chain control that you have. And I'm showing here one design of side chain that's linear, but you don't have to go that way. So this is the anode material and the P7525 has a measured gravimetric capacity of about 40 uh, a milliamp per hour per gram. Now on the cathode material, the other side, uh, we have um, a homopolymer we call PG3T2. For people who work in organic electronics, they'll recognize the backbone motif as sort of fruit fly of organic electronics, poly-3-hexylthiophene. And all that Alex did is graft, you know, all, I'm not a synthetic chemist, so it seems simple to me, is graft uh, glycolated side chains um, to this uh, motif. And the material works, gravimetric capacity is a little bit lower because I think now, if I remember correctly, you accept, um, I think it's uh, two charges per one and a half monomer or something like that. So not quite the same charge density as the P7525. So these are solution processable um, and uh, they can be used as sort of additive free redox active materials are both electron and ion conductors. So that's all you need for the electrode. And we expect that they're highly stable during electrochemical cycling. I'll show you that we can cycle them for uh, hundreds of cycles. And because they swell electrolytes, they may have high uh, uh, charge and discharge rates, uh, C rates over 100. So here's what the CVs look like um, in terms of um, stability. Um, sometimes these materials have a different um, cycle the very first time uh, you charge them. I think that's what the dashed line is, but once you sort of break them in, they're pretty stable. Here's the um, PNDI uh, 7525. Here's the uh, whole side, the PG3T2. Um, you can see that they're fairly reproducible. Um, some of the instability is really due to the fact that sometimes these uh, uh, oxidize a little bit, but it's really not something very, very fundamental. Um, I don't think there is a lot, whole, there's a whole lot more to say here. You can see sort of your classic CV. You put them together in an electrochemical cell and this is what the charging and discharging of the cell looks like. 
Now, in terms of retention, if you uh, look at how well the charges retain, 91% retention after an hour, it's not bad. Again, I would say that some of that has to do with oxidation, which can be avoided with better packaging. Uh, if the material that is supposed to uh, retain um, electrons oxidizes, it's essentially losing its charge. And so that's not desirable. Uh, in terms of where these stand were compared to uh, um, uh, compared to uh, the competition in Aragoni plot, uh, you can see that uh, these materials actually compared to other carbon-based materials do quite well. They're above most of them. Um, sort of the, the, the envelope of the curve is above most of them. So even at a given energy density, they will have a higher power density than most of them. Uh, Lignin-derived carbon being the exception there but I believe that one actually has binders. Uh, so we were doing quite well compared to other carbon-based materials and uh, it's fully recyclable, as I will show you. Uh, to put it in the broader context of our Agoni plot, uh, these materials also occupy a pretty interesting space. Uh, you can see that they're slightly to the right of electrochemical capacitors. So they have higher energy density with maybe a slightly lower power density, and they're getting sort of close to lead acid batteries. Uh, while being recyclable. So they, they occupy, I think, uh, you can see actually, it's sort of a void in the Ragoni plot. So it's a pretty interesting space to be in. And, and really, we just started developing these. I think there's a lot that can be done, as you will see towards the end of my talk. The recycling process is as simple as advertised. You make your battery, you deposit your films from solution. We, we drop cast them very simply. Uh, we, we're not really trying to make the best battery out there. We just want to demonstrate a concept. You use it a few times, charge, discharge, and then you can extract the polymer by just treating the electrodes with, um, with a solvent. Uh, you have now clean carbon paper and you can redeposit your uh, polymers and, and there you go, you have your recycled battery. Uh, in real life, it looks a little bit uglier. Um, here's, here's our materials in a vial, we deposit them, here's our electrodes on carbon paper, finished electrode um, with the current collectors. And then once you're done with charging and discharging, you put the carbon paper in a vial of solvent. This extracts the polymer. You remove the carbon paper. Here is your recycled polymer. You redeposit and uh, you make a new battery. Uh, I want to point out we do this in small quantities, uh, so this is not really very well controlled. And so I'm not convinced that we are recycling 100% of the polymer. There's probably some of it that's left a little bit behind. But this is uh, the data when we do it in our lab, again, not in a very, uh, very, very well controlled fashion. Um, so we first make our first battery, then we scan it 500 times, charge and discharge it 500 times, and we dissolve and redeposit, we make a new battery and so on. And once we do it three times, we're left with 67% of the capacity retention. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound that great, you've lost a third of your retention, but I just wanna remind you that this is done in a, in a lab uh, with small quantities of material. So if you lose a little bit of it, you're actually losing a large fraction of your electrode. It really just was to show the concept that you can get fairly high retention without really trying very hard. And here's a, a more complete data after different cycles. And, and this shows you a few things. First of all, during the cycling, you don't lose gravimetric capacity. You can see that after 500 cycles, the battery is pretty much identical to when it started both for the first time, the second time, and the third time after you recycle it. And when you recycle, you're losing capacity, and you're losing capacity mostly on the electron electrode, on the, uh, on the uh, electron bearing electrode. It's this P7525, and we think that it has, you'll see a little bit later, it, it, it does have some stability issues, and that's where we're losing a little bit of our material. But the interesting thing is that if you look at um, the um, coulometric efficiency um, after recycling, it's pretty much identical. And if you look at the gravimetric capacity versus the C rate from the first to the third recycling uh, cycle, uh, the efficiency, sorry, the gravimetric capacity has gone down, but how it depends on C rate is about the same. And the coulometric efficiency, the coulombic efficiency hasn't changed. And this tells you that when you recycle, you lose a little bit of capacity, but you're not really modifying uh, the material fundamentally. Now, uh, what, how do we know what happens after we cycle it? So the, the polymers we work with are semi-crystalline, polycrystalline, sorry, so they, sorry, semi-crystalline. And so if you put them in a synchrotron, they will diffract, but they also have amorphous regions. So you can look at before and after and diffraction patterns for the P7525 
PG3T2. So this is the hole bearing uh, electrode. Um, so in this case, the um, X-ray diffraction patterns are pretty much identical before and after. And the NMR is pretty much identical before and after. So this material actually has high chemical and electrochemical stability. On the electron side, we notice that um, if we use wet solvents, or if we don't, if we don't control the fact that we use anhydrous solvents, and some of the data that I showed you were used with solvents that were not perfectly anhydrous, we see new peaks showing up. When we actually really control anhydrous solvents, use anhydrous solvents, uh, those peaks disappear. And uh, you can see without anhydrous solvents, you have new peaks appear. But if you use uh, anhydrous solvents, uh, the X-ray diffraction pattern stays about the same. And again, the NMR, if you're really careful of this material, it stays about the same. So if you treat it well, if you're careful about your solvents, also the N-type material uh, is actually uh, pretty clean when you recycle it. And this is a little bit of a light motif in organic electronics. N-type materials are always a little bit more delicate than P-type materials. So how do we study these materials? We're in academia, we like to really figure out how things work. Well, the easiest thing to do is to study them ex situ. So you charge it, you remove the electrolyte, you stick it in the beam line. And uh, there is essentially two families of diffraction peaks that we're interested in. The first family is a diffraction peak in what we call the alkyl direction. So it's this direction here. Remember, the ions will come in here. Here is a cartoon of it. The ions will come between these two stacks and will expand them. And in fact, that's what you see as you charge it. You see the diffraction peak of that direction moves to lower Q. Uh, which means that that direction is expanding. The other direction is the direction between stacks, which is where some of the charge transport occur. That's called the pi stacking direction. And interestingly, when you expand in one direction, you actually contract in the other. I say interestingly because you would expect that because the volume of the unit cell should be constant. But these materials are van der Waals bonded. So I actually did not necessarily expect that, but you can see it. The pi stacking peak is moving to high Q, which means that those stacks are becoming a little bit closer. The interesting thing we observe is that these changes are reversible. When you charge and discharge, we looked at the data after. So when you, when you do the very first charging cycle, you sort of break in the material a little bit. And after that, essentially everything goes back and forth uh, very reversibly. And that's a very attractive feature of these materials because it tells you you can charge them and discharge them hundreds of times without really changing the structure of the material appreciably after charging discharging cycles. We're really excited that lately we're able to do this operando. So we have a cell that fits in the, uh, in the beam line where we have x-rays coming in one side, the electrolyte coming in the other. And so we can do scattering as we charge and discharge the material. So we can do CV in the beam line. And here is the data where you can see as we scan the CV, we can see the diffraction peaks go uh, in and out in terms of intensity. Here's an interesting thing. Um, this is the peak that has to do with that lamellar stacking where the ions get stuffed in and out. And you can see it changes in intensity, but not in position. So you're not changing, you're not really expanding and contracting very much. This is it with, with the different electrolytes, with ionic liquids, but it shows you the potential of these materials to, um, to be ionic conductors without really having undergoing uh, strong, charge, uh, strong structural transformations. And the nice thing is we can then measure charge transport as a function of charge density. And so we can see when the charge transport is optimized at what potentials, and this helps us design uh, better materials. So how do we improve the capacity? The Achilles heel of these materials is the capacity. Um, so remember that um, electron transport is the backbone, ion transport is the side chain. So if you wanna have more electrons per unit volume, uh, what you should do is have fewer um, side chains. Uh, so this, this is one way um, you can go about it. So we tried for this uh, P-type material, we tried three different length side chains. And uh, there is different things that come into play here. Um, first of all, it's, you, you imagine that the capacity will go up as you make the side chain shorter because you have more volume of the material that can accommodate charges. But remember that the side chains help with um, solubility. And so you have to balance the fact that you want to deposit these materials from a solution. If they have no side chains, they're essentially intractable. So here's a trade-off you're trying to um, you're trying to affect. Um, now, one one other aspect is that the side chains and the backbone they sort of interact to form the microstructure. So it turns out that the PG two T two, so the one with the shorter side chain, is much more disordered than the PG three T two, which is the one that I've been talking about so far. 
And, and you would think, okay, well, what's the problem with disorder? Well, the problem with disorder is electronic transport. Electronic transport likes ordered materials. And so when we made the one with the shorter side chains expecting to have a higher volumetric capacity, it turns out it had a lower volumetric capacity because a the theoretical capacity was not reached due to the fact that we had problems putting the ions into the microstructure and the electrons in for reasons that uh, I can explain in the Q&A, but they're really interesting. They have to do with the energetics of the crystals versus the amorphous areas. So, you know, the, the, the design of the material becomes a really interesting, it's promising. Synthetic chemists can make a lot of materials, but it's a very interesting fundamental science problem because it's not as obvious as you would think. Just take the side chains out and get a better material. Not only you get a material that doesn't reach a theoretical capacity, but you have a whole host of other interesting scientific issues. For example, it was very hard to recycle the PG2T2. It wouldn't come off the electrode. Now to improve the capacity of the anode, this is the material that I've showed you so far, this NDI T2, T75. So 75% of the side chains are glycolated to accept ions, 25% um, aren't. And that was actually to balance electronic and ionic transport. The theoretical gravimetric capacity is about 51. And I showed you we get to about 75% of that, I think about 35 or so. So how do you try to get higher gravimetric capacity? Well, try to get rid of the side chains. Remember, those are for solubility. So why not dissolve the film and then get rid of the side chains? Okay, maybe that becomes a problem for recycling, but you do get an electrode that has a higher volumetric capacity. So the idea is to have some chemistry that allows you side chain cleavage. This is the monomer we're now considering. And these side chains can be cleaved off. And now actually you can accept more electrons per monomer because this unit uh, this uh, benzene dithiophene unit can accept electrons as well. It can, in fact, accept two electrons that will sit mostly on the oxygens. And so now you can actually have a theoretical capacity that's a lot higher, uh, three times as high as that of the, of, of the one that has the side chains. Um, so, and this has, like I said, uh, four um, electron acceptors. You can start playing with the side chains also of the NDI unit to branch them off, and that allows you to make them shorter but still have good solubility. You can go even all the way to considering only the benzene diethylphene unit and cleave the side chain afterwards. So this is sort of a different space where maybe recycling is less important, uh, but you get a higher capacity um, by uh, removing the side chains. So I guess the message here is that there's a lot of uh, latitude for uh, synthetic design to have uh, materials that will have higher capacity and, and balance out this aspect of solubility versus capacity versus the ability to recycle these materials. And, and also, you know, we're looking at the capacity compared to lithium ion batteries, but that's not necessarily, um, that's not necessarily the competition. We can think of a lot of contexts where you would like a thin film battery that has an okay capacity, but has other interesting aspects. For example, you could leave it out in the field without having to worry about recycling it. If you play your cards right, you might make a degradable polymer, for example. Um, so as Will said, I think this is a very rich field uh, that has just, uh, I guess I shouldn't say it hasn't really uh, been mined. Uh, 25 years ago, there was a lot of interest in redox polymers for batteries. Then the field of organic electronics moved in a different direction. Now we're, I wouldn't say we're reinventing the wheel, but we're dis rediscovering how interesting these materials are. And I'm very excited that we can throw all these really interesting characterization techniques uh, in the way of understanding how these materials work in order to design uh, better and better materials. Um, so this is the essence of what I wanted to talk about today. I want to thank the team that's been able to uh, make this happen. A lot of this is a brainchild of a current, uh, uh, he's a postdoc in my group, but really operates as an independent scientist, Alex Giovanniti. Uh, as, uh, um, as Will mentioned, we're also looking at these materials for electrocatalysis. Uh, when you look at them, if you work in that field, it becomes obvious. You have now a material that has extra electrons that are available for reaction and can bring uh, uh, reagents in because it swells in electrolytes. So we're looking at that. Adam Marks is our resident synthetic chemist. I've never had a synthetic chemist in my group, but now that we're trying to really understand structural property relationships in materials, uh, we have a synthetic chemist in the group. And then a uh, whole bunch of other students, Melissa, Tyler, Garrett, uh, Ben is a former postdoc as well. Chris Takax is a um, 
is a staff scientist at Slack, and Ile Wu is in uh, Janan Bao's uh, group, he's a collaborator. And these are really to throw characterization techniques at these materials and understand how they work. Some of the original materials come from Ian McCulloch's group now at Oxford. And I want to thank uh, the funding for this work, the Tomcat Center and uh, Storage X for a seed grant on recyclable batteries. So thank you everyone for your attention and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Alberto, for that wonderful presentation and introduction to um, conducting polymers. So um, we have a, a number of questions. Uh, maybe I'll start with the high level ones, um, if that's okay with you, Alberto. Sure. Um, help us understand the context in which the polymers might be used. So I think you highlighted electrode and redox act reactions as the primary application. Um, but as I alluded to, um, the energy density can be a bit limited. Um, are there other applications within energy storage, maybe as another component of the battery that the polymers can find use for? Well, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about it. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I was thinking more what type of application would benefit from the form factor and the flexibility, not so much different components of, of batteries. You know, I'm thinking that uh, part of my group works on um, uh, electronic components for soft robotics. And, and there maybe you, you know, really the premium comes from the fact that you could have a large area of something that ends up storing energy. And because the materials are flexible, uh, you're able to use more of, of an object to store energy. So the capacity per unit mass is not that great, but you have a large area that's available to you, or you can fold it and do all sorts of interesting things. I never thought about other components of batteries. Do you have something in mind? Um, you know, I'm just trying to brainstorm to see if, um, you know, classically inactive materials could benefit from mm -hmm. some redox yeah. property. Yeah, so that, exactly. Actually, that's a very good point. I've seen proposals of using, um, maybe it's not part of a battery, but it's part of an object. The casing of an object is made of plastic. Maybe that becomes part of your energy storage. Sounds very exciting. Um, it, along those lines, um, in these polymer materials, what, what do you think is the limit of its capacity, graphometric capacity? So you you highlighted pathway to get extremely attractive um, capacity, you know, several hundred million bars per gram. So that's already uh, at the levels of um, today's battery technology. Of course, the voltage is lower compared to lithium ion, but the capacity is attractive. Um, you know, at some point you're gonna, you know, have something that is, is so light uh, as a molecule that may not work, but what, what does that limit look like, you think? In terms, in terms of numbers, I don't know. In, in terms of fundamental limit, it's going to be the stability of the materials. That's, mm -hmm. that's really a challenge. Um, and, and then it becomes also an issue of packaging. And, mm -hmm. But the electrochemical stability is, is the wall that, that will hit first, I, I think. Mm -hmm. once, once you, what we observe when we look at these materials by spectral electrochemistry is that once you start putting a lot of charges per unit monomer, mm -hmm. those coalesce in, in bipolarons and trions, all sorts of things that tend to be very reactive. It is actually, Alberta, very interesting because in inorganic material, there's exactly the same problems. You, you oxidize it too much, you reduce it too much, then the essentially the percolations of these polarons um, give you a lot of problem for structure transformation. So I think it's one of the same problem. And I think I'm trying to understand how far you can go. Um, you know, how, how dense of electrons can you add to the system? Um, but it sounds like there's some room for further improvement even beyond what you have roadmapped. Yeah. So your point about uh, the electrochemical stability was the next question. Um, you, can you give us a sense, um, you know, a lot of times we think about polymer as being more compatible in an aqueous environment, but uh, this need not to be the case, right? Uh, it can also be quite compatible in non-aqueous environments. Um, what is sort of the, the window of voltage that these materials live in? Um, it gives a sense of maybe, you know, relative to hydrogen or relative to lithium, where it can sit Ooh. comfortably. <laughs> I, oh, relative to hydrogen or lithium. I always, I always think of relative to silver, silver chloride, and, and you, you saw the numbers. So, um, w w uh, yeah, sorry, I can't do it off the top of my head relative to lithium or, or, or hydrogen. Um, 
relative to silver silver chloride i mean you saw that it's it's uh it's in the order of uh one and a half two volt type thing mm -hmm. so like, like you said the, the voltage is, is intrinsically limited there compared to lithium right but i, I think one thing that's also uh, maybe it's it's broadly appreciated in the lithium ion battery field is that the electrochemical stability window doesn't have to be that big because for the electrodes because the electrodes only see you know part of the battery's environment mm, right. uh, it, it is a, the separator that has to see the entire range um, mm -hmm. so you know the the voltage you described um, you know would make it quite compatible for example in the in the positive electrode of a lithium ion battery in a negative I think it's too reducing. So do you think there is a possibility to introduce um, maybe a, a solid state battery or some other thing in which we can really separate the two electrodes without problems and uh, choose a polymer with a limited voltage stability and use but it as a battery? Mm -hmm. And maybe pair with a inorganic material. Um, we don't necessarily need to have an all organic battery. Right, um, yeah, I, I never thought about it. That's a really good point. Um, like I said, I come at it from a completely different uh, <laughs> different side. So these are all questions that I never considered. Great, Albert. Maybe we have time for one last question. Um, can you give us a sense of the um, the decomposition product um, of these polymers? Is it could it be in in the gas or is it mostly in in solid or liquid states? It, I mean, it, they oxidize, and so you you form. Uh, a small fragment that goes away and the polymer is oxidized, something like that. So they're they're uh, in in the liquid. They end up in the electric. The liquid state. Okay, yeah. I think uh, in another major problem for lithium ion batteries is, is outgassing. Um, the, if the decomposition product is a liquid, it's actually a little easier to handle from the reliability and safety perspective. Whereas as if it's a gas, it's a little harder to work with um, right. because it increases the pressure of the cell substantially. Right. No. Um, let's see. Um, I think that is all we have time for, Alberto, in terms of questions. We'll come back after Kevin's talk, and then we'll discuss more polymers. Okay. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you. And uh, now if I can ask Kevin to come to the stage as well. There you are, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, so as I introduced earlier, um, Kevin is representing Blue Currents, um, a... Um, a somewhat uh, a modestly young startup that has been in stealth mode for a number of years. Um, Kevin is the chief uh, technology officer for Blue Current and has been spearheading the development of its core technology um, for solid state batteries uh, for uh, nearly is it five years. Is that right, Kevin? Yeah, about four and a half now. Four, four and a half years. And um, uh, Kevin um, uh, received his PhD from uh, UC Berkeley, uh, working on uh, polymer materials. And one thing that has really impressed me about Blue Current is that um, folks there kept their heads down, worked on the technology for many years. Um, there's not, you know, exciting press releases. Um, and um, after all this time, and really something really neat comes out at the end, and then Kevin is going to share that with us today. So as I mentioned, Kevin, I really appreciate you um, um, working with us to, to reveal some of these new exciting data on your technology, and we can't wait um, to, to learn. Yeah, thank you, Will. Uh, and I have to say, your, your last questions there with Alberto were uh, playing my heartstrings a little bit. I think uh, batteries have a pretty rich history in, in using soft matter and, and polymers. Uh, and a lot of what we're doing as a company is combining polymers with inorganic materials. So uh, looking forward to chatting with Alberto about that. All right, so uh, thank you everybody. Thank you again, Will. Uh, my name is Kevin Lujic and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Blue Current. And I'm here today to talk to you about how Blue Current is building a completely dry solid state battery uh, using a silicon anode active material. Uh, so Blue Current was founded in 2014. Uh, we're currently located in Hayward, California. And as Will mentioned, you know, we've been pretty quiet as a company for the past several years. Uh, we were working with our heads down. We, we really believe in the materials that we've been working on. But uh, we always felt like it was really important to get the science right before kind of coming out of stealth mode and starting to scale the technology. So um, we recently received $30 million uh, and funding from Coke Industries. Uh, this is to 
forward the build out of our company's uh, pilot manufacturing line at our facility in Hayward. Um, I have here the Cal logo and the Stanford logo. Uh, this is because our co-founders, Natash Balsara and, and Jody Simone are from these two universities. Uh, in addition to developing a, a, a great battery technology, we've also been able to demonstrate that these two universities can actually collaborate together. So I'm happy to put those logos there. Um, so what does it mean to get the science right? Uh, you know, we've, we've had a very deep history as a company working with various uh, electrolyte materials and active materials. Um, solid state batteries are getting a ton of attention right now. And we believe that there are some core challenges to getting concrete batteries to work that really have to be solved before the, these technologies can be scaled. So what are those problems? Uh, firstly is safety. Um, you know, a lot of what has to be done in order to get solid state to work, uh, what we've seen is that to get to the energy densities and the rate capabilities that a lot of these companies are promising, we see a lot of, of companies and research groups going and compromising on their technology. Uh, so the first compromise we typically see is folks adding liquid back to their cells. Um, in an ideal world, a solid state battery would be completely dry. Um, but if a battery is completely dry, you have uh, new challenges that have to be solved. Um, inside of a battery, you have active material particles that have to communicate with an electrolyte. Uh, typically in a lithium ion battery, if that electrolyte is a liquid, it's very easy to achieve transport of lithium ions from the electrolyte to the active materials. Um, but if you're replacing that liquid with something that's solid, it becomes really difficult to get your electrolyte to essentially wet the surface of the active materials. Um, so in order to overcome that challenge, we see companies and research groups going and adding liquid electrolyte back to their cell. Um, as everybody knows, liquid electrolytes are flammable. Um, State-of-the-art lithium ion batteries today have this flammable liquid electrolyte inside of them. One of the biggest driving forces for moving to solid state is to essentially replace this liquid with something that's fully dry and inherently safe. So going and adding liquid back to our cells to achieve this ion transport is essentially taking a step back in achieving inherent safety. Um, we also know that liquid electrolytes are generally reactive with various active materials that go into the battery. Uh, silicon, for instance. Um, silicon, you know, it has this problem where during charge and discharge, it can expand and contract. Um, this expansion and contraction in the presence of a liquid leads to continuous reactivity that essentially depletes the battery of its lithium content. So another way around this problem of getting ion transport between the electrolyte and the active materials is to apply pressure to fully dry cells. Um, and this is sort of the second compromise we see. Um, pressure is applied to solid state batteries, like I said, to achieve ion transport between the electrolyte and the active materials. Um, it's also applied so that you can get good ion transport between the separator and the electrodes. Um, pressure is applied using essentially, you know, two plates that are put on either side of the cell. The plates are fastened together. Um, they can be extremely thick, extremely heavy. The fasteners themselves can add a lot of weight. Uh, so ultimately, by applying pressure, you're reducing the overall system level energy density. So it's really critical, and we're going to talk more about this. It's really critical that solid state battery companies can find a way to reduce the amount of uh, pressure that's required for cells to operate. Uh, we also see companies compromising on temperature, and this is particularly true for polymer electrolytes. Um, polymer electrolytes, you're essentially taking organic polymer, you're taking lithium salt. Lithium salts can dissolve in these polymers, which is itself magical. Um, but in order for that polymer electrolyte to have a high ionic conductivity, uh, you typically have to raise the electrolyte temperature up to about 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. Um, so this is really high temperature that can essentially just limit the number of commercial applications you can have in the material. Um, and then lastly here is scalability. Um, there actually are solid state batteries on the market today, um, but they're produced in very, very small sizes. So about the size of a fingernail. Um, it's really difficult to scale the manufacturing processes that are used to make these, these uh, commercially available solid state cells today. So, um, so we have to essentially address all four of these. And as a company, you know, part of the reason why we've, we've taken so long to kind of come out of stealth mode and, and start to scale is because we've wanted to solve all of these problems before scaling. Um, and you know, I think today's conversation is, is really appropriate because we feel like polymers are at the core of us solving these problems. 
So when we think about the broader industry landscape, uh, we've come up with a map. Um, here, what we're showing is essentially a four quadrant map where on the x-axis you have um, the anode active material type or the, the electrode type. So we have lithium metal on the left and silicon on the right. And then on the y-axis, we have the electrolyte type. So on the top, we have solid electrolytes. And on the bottom, we have liquid electrolytes. A lot of battery research today is focused on the top left and the bottom right. Um, as a company, what's sort of unique about us is that we've actually had a chance to work on three of these. Uh, so we have a really deep expertise in, in developing uh, you know, many different kinds of next generation battery technologies. We also have people on the team that have worked in the bottom right, including myself. Um, so what is probably considered to be the most ready for next generation batteries is um, liquid electrolytes with silicon. Um, silicon is an extremely energy dense material um, by replacing one gram of graphite with one gram of silicon, you can store 10 times uh, more lithium. So it's extremely energy dense. Um, as I mentioned before, though, as silicon is uh, being charged and discharged, the volume expansion of the silicon is, is, is pretty extreme. So a silicon active material particle can expand by up to 300% during charge and then it'll contract during discharge. Um, on the surface of the silicon active material, there's an SEI layer form that forms to essentially protect the active material particle from the electrolyte. Um, the formation of that SEI layer actually consumes lithium from the liquid electrolyte. And what happens is as particles are expanding and contracting, um, that SEI layer will actually break open during charge, during the expansion. Um, new SEI layer will form. And then during discharge, um, as the particles are shrinking, that SEI layer will essentially delaminate from the active material particle, which then exposes new active material surface, which reacts with more liquid electrolyte. And this process just happens continuously throughout cycling. Um, long story short, this essentially depletes the cell of its lithium content. Um, the battery capacity will rapidly fade. So, you know, cell manufacturers want to implement as much silicon as possible into their anode, but they have to overcome this fundamental challenge. Um, as a result, state-of-the-art cells today only have about five to 10% of, of silicon in their anode. So it, it would be amazing if we can go to higher silicon content in the anode. Um, and that is essentially the approach that Blue Current is taking, is to use a solid electrolyte system to overcome all of those challenges that I just mentioned, to have stable cycling with a high silicon content. Um, and that's what we've been able to develop. Um, our anodes have over three times the silicon content of liquid electrolyte lithium ion cells. I'll, I'll go into more of that in a few slides. Um, and then on the left, we have lithium metal. Um, you know, for a long time now, I, I would almost say that solid state has become synonymous with lithium metal. Um, lithium metal has this core problem where during charge and discharge, as lithium is being passed from one side of the cell to the other, um, dendrites can form from one side to the other that essentially can short circuit the cell. Um, for a long time, solid electrolytes have been pursued as a material that can perhaps prevent dendrite growth and, and stop uh, internal short circuiting. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, our company has had the chance to work on essentially three out of these four quadrants. Um, and in fact, we spent the first four years as a company working on lithium metal. Um, so from 2014 to 2018, we were working with lithium metal, and then it was in 2018 that we made the pivot to silicon. And we've been purely focused on silicon ever since then. Um, so why did we make this transition and, and why are we working on silicon? This is, this is a question that we get a lot. Um, and it comes down to really just a simple energy density calculation. Uh, back in 2018, um, you know, we were working on all of the same problems that a lot of other research groups are, um, trying to prevent dendrite growth, trying to design solid electrolyte materials that could allow lithium metal to cycle stably. Um, but it was actually more practical challenges that caused us to turn our attention to silicon. Um, that really had to do with uh, the thickness of the lithium metal that we could find commercially. Um, it's really important for batteries that every component of the battery is as thin and as lightweight as possible. Uh, we were looking for you know, commercially available lithium metal that was essentially sub 20 micrometers. And everything we could find was, was 30 micrometers or greater. 
Um, so freestanding lithium metal foil. Lithium, lithium is a tricky metal. Um, it's, it's metal, but it's very soft. It's hard to process into really thin foil thicknesses. Um, so that really the thinnest we could find was about 30 micrometers in thickness. Uh, we could also find lithium that was deposited on copper, but there, you know, the copper current collector was about 10 micrometers. Um, the excess lithium was about 20 micrometers. So we were still kind of around this 30 micrometer number. Um, we also knew that we could perhaps pursue some more advanced approach where maybe you are vapor depositing lithium onto a, a copper current collector surface. Uh, this really just seemed challenging to us and it just seemed very difficult to scale. So we took a step back and we said to ourselves, you know, we have all of these fundamental problems with lithium. It's, it's, you know, we have dendrite formation growth. We have to solve the general reactivity problem of lithium with, with the electrolyte interface. Um, is it possible that there's another active material out there that can get us into a similar ballpark as this 30 micrometer number that I mentioned? Um, while also completely avoiding all of the challenges that I just mentioned. Um, and the answer was yes. And, and you know, the approach we took was that we had to get to a high enough silicon content in our anode to essentially be competitive to this lithium metal thickness. And what I'm showing here on the right um, is a graph of anode volumetric capacity versus expected anode thickness. Um, this is uh, for a cathode that would be, that would be three milliamp hours per centimeter squared an N to P ratio of 1.2, um, and a range of different silicon active materials. Um, and this essentially became our target. We said to ourselves, you know, we have this whole spectrum of different silicon active materials we could use. Um, they can give you all of these, this, this range of specific capacities, um, target the ones that are going to give us a high silicon content, and then also allow us to be competitive energy, in energy density to lithium metal. Um, so, Jumping more into the technology, um, starting with the anode, as I mentioned, uh, we use a silicon-based active material. We purchase this material from suppliers. Um, we are not a, you know, a silicon active material manufacturer. We really are an integrator. Um, we've been able to implement over three times the silicon content of cellular lithium ion cells. Um, and our anode has a proprietary composite electrolyte material inside of it, which um, came throughout our battery. Um, one of the unique approaches that we've taken is that when we started off as a company, when, when we pivoted to solid state in 2016, um, we believed that really there were two classes of electrolyte materials. We had polymer electrolyte materials. Polymers are, um, they're mechanically robust, they're flexible, they're great at adhering to interfaces, um, they're commercially abundant. Um, but their ionic conductivity is generally low. Um, then there's this other class of materials, which is inorganic glass ceramic materials. They have a really high conductivity um, at room temperature. They have a single ion transference number of close to one, um, but they're really brittle and they're, they're generally difficult to interface with other materials, like active materials in an electrode. So we had this belief as a company that you need to combine the two materials. Um, so, you know, going back to what I mentioned before, combining a soft matter of an inorganic electrolyte material, that really has been um, our, our approach for the past several years. Um, in the separator, we also have a composite. Um, we use sulfide inorganic electrolytes that we synthesize in-house. That's one of the unique things about our company is that all of the inorganic electrolyte material we use we can actually synthesize um, right here at our facility and we're, we're in the process of scaling that material up. Uh, these separators are below 30 micrometers in thickness and it's the combination of the polymer's mechanical robustness with the high ionic con conductivity of the inorganic material um, that allows the separator to be both um, high in, in conductivity, especially at low pressure, but also mechanically robust enough to withstand a lot of um, the conditions that the battery will face in commercial settings. In the cathode, we use high voltage transition metal oxide active materials, so things like NMC and NCA. And the cathode also has our proprietary composite electrolyte. Lastly here, one of the things our company has had to do is, is figure out how, how do you assemble a solid state battery? Um, it's one thing to take all of the components of the battery, sandwich them together, 
and then apply an extremely high pressure. Um, but as I mentioned before, high pressure is, is really detrimental for the energy density of the cell um, in a commercial setting. So um, we have to figure out how do you actually process a battery in a way that'll allow all the components to be thin, for instance, with the separator being sub 30 microliters. Um, and how do you process it in a way that'll allow for low pressure operation? So as I mentioned before, um, silicon has you know, this, this amazing energy density and specific capacity, um, but it has a lot of challenges, right? And, and the one I mentioned before is expansion and contraction throughout cycling. Um, this can lead to this SCI layer formation in a liquid electrolyte um, and in a solid electrolyte cell, what's even more challenging is that you have to maintain a really good interface between the silicon active material and your electrolyte network while this expansion and contraction is happening. And our approach to that has been in these silicon active materials with a composite electrolyte that provides elasticity and high ionic conductivity. Uh, we refer to this combination of silicon with the composite as being a silicon elastic composite. Um, we've pursued a number of different polymer systems as a company. Uh, we've developed polymer electrolytes. We've developed polymer systems where you are essentially cross-linking a network. Um, and then we've also developed polymers that are functionalized to improve elasticity and improve ad adhesion between particles, both electrolyte particles as well as electrolyte particles with active material particles. So again, our whole approach has been to utilize polymers to maintain contact between all of the solid materials inside the solid state battery. We think this approach is particularly valuable um, in getting silicon active material to cycle stably in a fully dry environment. Again, you know, we're not adding any liquid electrolyte to our cell. So it's really critical that you have some flexibility and compliance, especially within the anode so that you can have all of your materials in, in contact with each other. Uh, so when Blue Current was founded, uh, we, had, we really had one vision um, that was to deliver a completely safe battery. Um, in fact, we held that, for a long time, we held that higher than, than performance. I would say that even today, um, we still consider safety to be the number one priority for solid state cells. Um, so we've gone and done a lot of safety testing. You know, it, it's easy to claim that solid state batteries can be you know, inherently safe, but it's really important that we can actually go uh, and demonstrate that. So uh, we've worked with an external third party to, doing, to do a wide array of safety testing. Uh, we've done nail penetration, crush testing, overcharge testing, and accelerated rate calorimetry testing. All of this has been performed on multi-layer cells. Um, we actually made, as a company, we, we started making multi-layer solid state cells in 2018. Uh, we were making these cells by hand and we were really making them singularly for the purpose of doing safety testing, believe it or not. Um, it turns out that four to 500 milliamp hours is sort of the minimum uh, size you need in order to do accelerator rate calorimetry testing. So, um, so all of this testing has been done on roughly 500 milliamp hour uh, pouch cells. Um, you can see an example of test set up here um, for the nail penetration. And one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll mention is in all of these tests, uh, we would measure the hydrogen sulfide gas formation um, during the test. The reason for that is, is that because we have a sulfide electrolyte inside of the cell, um, sulfide electrolytes, they can react with moisture in air and form hydrogen sulfide gas. And so we really quantify and characterize whether or not hydrogen sulfide gas was forming, and if so, how much of it was. Um, you can also see a schematic for the cells we were testing. We purposely tried to double-sided coat uh, one of our electrodes that we were minimizing the amount of current collector inside of the cell. Um, this is important in, in sort of um, replicating what energy density and, and uh, you would achieve at scale. And, and um, you know, we want these, the safety test to essentially represent what, what the cell will look like once it's scaled up to a two amp hour or 10 amp hour pouch size. So just briefly looking at some of the safety testing results here, this is for nail penetration. Um, in all of these tests, the cells were charged to 100% state of charge before um, the abuse testing occurred. Um, here, we would pierce the cell with a, a sharpened steel nail um, and then measure the cell voltage 
the temperature and again, the H2S, uh, whether or not H2S was forming throughout the test. Um, and the results here, uh, the, the takeaway for the nail penetration as well as the crush and the overcharge test is that none of these tests resulted in thermal runaway. Um, there was no venting or rejection of cell materials. Um, and there was no detection of hydrogen sulfide gas throughout the test. Uh, we consider this to be a really important and compelling takeaway. Um, there is um, a lot of question with sulfide electrolyte materials, whether or not um, they're gonna be safe in a commercial setting. But our, our experience has been that uh, once the sulfide electrolytes are, are integrated into the electrodes and separate the components, um, it's actually hard for the materials to still generate hydrogen sulfide gas in a commercial setting. So um, this was really compelling for us. Um, our mission from the beginning in 2014 really was to develop a completely safe battery. Um, and it was really encouraging to go and get these results with, with um, you know, commercially relevant cell sizes. Um, so taking a step back and looking at the energy density for our cells, um, we are projecting that at a, for a 10 amp hour cell, our cells will have about 710 to 935 watt hours per liter um, in energy density. Gravimetrically, we'll have about 270 to 335 watt hours per kilogram. Um, so this is, of course, not as high as lithium metal, right? Lithium metal is sort of the gold standard when it comes to energy density. Uh, just based on the periodic table, it's, it's, it's difficult to have something that's going to be more energy dense than lithium metal. Um, but that's really for theoretical projections of lithium metal, and it's possible that um, our cell's energy density ends up being very comparable um, to commercially viable lithium metal cells. Um, and at the very least, we say that it's, it's going to be about 90% of the theoretical uh, lithium metal energy, energy density. And we can achieve all of this, though, while it being inherently safe. Um, and what that means is that because the cells and the materials are inherently safe, you'll also have energy density gains at the system level. Um, so as I mentioned before, when we did this calculation in 2018, we recognized that it was really, really important that we can get to high silicon contents in the anode. And here what we're showing is essentially for a range of anode specific capacities and weight percentages um, plotted as anode volumetric capacity, what the expected cell level volumetric energy density would be. Um, if we were stuck around five to 10% silicon content, um, like a lot of state-of-the-art commercial cells are, our cell energy density would only be between four to 600 watt hours per liter. Um, but because we can cycle stably with high silicon contents, this allows us to um, get to much, much higher energy densities. Currently today, we're around 700 watt hours per liter, which is very comparable to commercially uh, available lithium ion cells. Um, and we have a conservative roadmap to get to 900 plus watt hours per liter. Um, and this is all, of course, um, driven by the silicon content that we can achieve. Um, but it's absolutely critical that we can achieve high silicon contents without sacrificing cycle lifetime. Um, and this is one of the things that has been really, really exciting for us, um, has been just demonstrating and, and being able to see um, the cycle life that we can obtain with high silicon contents. So this is cycle life data for a cell that has um, a little over three times the silicon content of the state-of-the-art lithium ion cell. Um, here, we're, we're, we're uh, cycling the cells at about 28 degrees Celsius. They're being charged and discharged at C over five. Uh, the voltage cutoffs are 2.0 to 4.2 volts. And we're cycling the cells at about 2.5 megapascals, which is something that I'll come back, come back to in a few slides. Um, and you can see that after 1,000 cycles, we've been able to um, retain over 85% of the cell's capacity. We're comparing this to um, very hypothetical lines drawn here for traditional lithium ion, which can get to about 800 to 1,000 cycles at 80% capacity retention, um, as well as cells um, with a very high silicon content and liquid electrolyte. They can typically get to about two to 300 cycles before um, hitting 80% capacity retention. So the takeaway here is that um, by going to high silicon content, um, we can drive energy density upwards 
and we're not sacrificing cycle lifetime. So we've been able to achieve really, really stable cycling at high silicon contents, which we feel like is, is ex extremely compelling. Um, and I'll mention again that the way we, we essentially get all of this to work is through our silicon elastic composite. So having, having polymer materials within the cell that, that can allow silicon to expand and contract during cycling while still maintaining contact with the electrolyte network. Another critical factor um, in achieving high energy density is uh, the separator. Um, the separator in a state-of-the-art lithium ion cell today is about eight to 10 micrometers thick. Um, so it's incredibly important for solid state that separators are also um, that thin. Um, we believe that our separator, um, because we're focusing on silicon as opposed to lithium metal, the overall processing quality control and scale up, um, is, it, it all becomes a lot easier, right? Because we don't have to design and engineer a separator that's gonna be completely defect free, um, perhaps, you know, completely, you know, high temperature center. And um, you know, because we don't have to worry about dendrite formation, uh, it makes scaling of the separator a lot easier. Uh, we also believe that taking this approach of having a composite gives you both high ionic conductivity and it also gives you mechanical robustness that's necessary to get to thin thicknesses. And a lot of the work that we've had to do internally is figuring out what are the best formulations that allow you to get down to sub 20 micrometers in thickness without having a, a separator film that's too brittle or that starts to tear during the manufacturing process. Um, you can see on the right here what I'm plotting is separator thickness versus expected volumetric energy density. Um, a lot of solid state battery research today is kind of focused on separator thicknesses, you know, 100 micrometers and, and above. Um, a lot of solid state research uses things like pellets that are just kind of sandwiched between the, the anode and the cathode. Um, but you can see how important separator thickness is. Um, just going from 30 micrometers to 10 micrometers, you have almost a 100 watt hour per liter gain in energy density. So it's incredibly important that the separator is, is, is thin and we feel that this approach of, of using composites is, is critical in achieving that. So just a couple of slides here on rate capability. Um, as a company, we have always strived to get our cells to operate at low temperatures and at room temperature. We wanna have rate capabilities that are um, on par and that surpass lithium ion cells today. Um, here, we're looking at discharge rate capability for um, a cell that is identical to the one that I, I mentioned before. Um, the cathode loading is about three milliamp hours per centimeter squared. Um, these are, I should have meant this before, but these are small test cells. These are about 2.5 centimeters squared in size. Um, and we're going and doing a discharge rate sweep here, um, starting at C over five and going all the way to four C. Um, this is all at being done at 28 degrees Celsius, just a little over room temperature. Um, so looking at our, our performance here at 1C, we can still achieve over 90% of our C over five capacity. And when we go to 4C, we can still achieve over 75% of the C over five capacity. Um, it's really interesting that we, we don't see a, a, a significant drop off in the capacity that we're obtaining at these high C rates. Um, this can be attributed to our transference number being close to unity. Um, so again, relying on the ionic conductivity of the glass ceramic material gives us this room temperature rate capability that, that um, is really compelling. Um, and then looking at the charge rate capability data, um, here we're doing a charge rate sweep. We're starting at C over five and going all the way up to 2C. Um, identical cell as before. And the takeaway here is that um, when we charge our cell at 1C, we can obtain over 95% of the C over 5 capacity. Um, we can charge our cells at 2C um, and get it over 93% of the cell's capacity. And another way of looking at this is that um, we can obtain about 80% state of charge in 20 to 25 minutes. And as a company, we're continuing to strive towards getting to this 80% um, SOC in 15 minute number that um, is sort of the gold standard. So one of the last things I'll, I'll talk about here is, is operating pressure. Um, I mentioned before the importance of pressure in solid state cells. Pressure can be used to essentially sandwich materials together. It helps with ionic conductivity and, and, and getting uh, contact between the electrolyte and the reactive materials. 
um, but pressure has a huge impact on the system level energy density. And I'll talk about that in, on the next slide. What, what we've been able to do as a company is systematically reduce the amount of operating pressure required for our cells um, over time. So back in 2018, uh, we were getting you know, very compelling cycling stability, over 1,000 cycles at C over five room temperature. Um, but those cells were all cycling at about 40 megapascals. And we knew that this was not gonna be commercially viable so what we've been doing over time is going and, and just pushing that pressure lower and lower and lower. Um, where we are today, uh, we have cells that have cycled again, again as I mentioned before, for 1,000 plus cycles with greater than 80% capacity retention at 2.5 megapascals. And more recently, um, we've been able to achieve pressures at one megapascal and even lower. And we have cells, prototype cells, that are now cycling um, at these low pressures room temperature, C over five, um, that have achieved hundreds of cycles with greater than 80% capacity retention. Uh, we achieve all of this through this proprietary silicon elastic composite approach where we're taking inorganic glass ceramic materials and combining them with polymers so that we can maintain contact between the silicon active material and the electrolyte network um, during cycling. And again, we're not adding any liquid electrolyte to our cells. So there's a, a, you know, a, a big question in the solid state battery community, which is what is an acceptable pressure uh, that cells can operate at in a commercial setting and, and in an electric vehicle battery pack? Um, so one of the things that we've done internally is, is try to answer that question ourselves. In automotive companies, it can be really difficult to provide an exact number of what this is. Um, pack design is a very tricky thing. Um, it's, you know, within automotive companies, there are many departments that are actually involved in, in designing what the pack's going to look like. Um, so it, it can be difficult to really provide, you know, one singular number, which is kind of what all, you know, we should be shooting for as solid state battery companies. So what we've tried to do internally is develop um, a finite element analysis model. Um, this is some work that was led by Joseph Peterson, who was a mechanical engineer on our team, who's, who really is just amazing. Um, and what we're doing here is taking sort of an industry standard lithium ion module uh, using the same dimensions for the cells. Um, and we're going and varying the thickness of the plates and we're also varying the number of fasteners, right? Because as pressure increases, you're gonna need more and more fasteners to essentially achieve uh, the amount of pressure. Um, so we're varying the thickness of the plates and then we're going and calculating the plate thickness, the plate mass, the plate volume, and then ultimately we're calculating the system level energy density um, for a wide range of, of materials. I'm only showing one material here and this is stainless steel um, and, and, and cell level energy densities. So what you're looking at here on the right is cell level energy density plotted against system level energy density. And this is for um, a range of, of operating pressures, right? So we have 0 0.2 megapascals all the way up to seven megapascals. Uh, so the first thing you can see is that um, as cell level energy density is increasing, system level energy density is increasing. This is um, obvious, right? Um, but the second thing is that as pressure, as operating pressure is increasing, you can see that the expected system level energy density is dropping dramatically. So if we just look at um, you know, around 700 watt hours per liter or so, going from 0 0.2 megapascals down to seven mega or up to seven megapascals results in a loss of about 150 watt hours per liter. Um, so you can start to see why operating pressure is so critical uh, to system level energy density. Another way that we can think about this is that if you were to have a cell with an expected energy density of 1000 watt hours per liter, um, if that cell has to operate at seven megapascals, it's actually not going to have a higher system level energy density than a 650, 675 watt hour per liter cell um, that's operating at 0 0.2 or 0 0.5 megapascals. So we use this thinking to really direct our developments internally. Um, and it's, it's very obvious why pressure is so important. Um, if you have to have really, really thick plates that are put on either side of the cell, the system level energy density is just not going to be much higher than state of the art today. Um, so we have here, it's, this little star just represents, um, you know, an industry reported system level energy density for a commercial electric vehicle. Um, so the long story short is that this problem absolutely has to be solved for fully dry solid state cells. 
Um, you know, the, having a fully dry solid state cell is really the most promising way to increase energy density as well as safety. Um, but it comes with this challenge of having to apply higher pressures. And we believe that taking this approach of using polymers and using a, an elastic composite can allow us to go to lower and lower pressures without sacrificing system level energy density. Um, so lastly here, um, the approach we've taken is, is really uniquely scalable. Um, we use all of the same lithium ion battery manufacturing equipment. Um, it's just taken from um, you know, the, the standard processes for making lithium ion cells. These are high volume manufacturing techniques. We really aren't doing anything new or exotic when it comes to manufacturing of the cells. Um, solid state also has the ability to potentially eliminate, uh, well, it will certainly eliminate fill and it also has the ability to eliminate formation. Um, so this can lead to some pretty substantial capital expenditure savings. Um, and we believe that the approach we're taking really is fully scalable. Uh, so to summarize here, um, Blue Current has been developing fully dry silicon based solid state batteries um, since 2018. That really has been our singular focus for the past four years. Uh, we believe in um, a composite material, a fully dry solid state battery cell, a fully dry electrolyte can give us inherent safety. We have been able to demonstrate that at third party test facilities. Um, this approach has been able to deliver over 1,000 cycles with greater than 80% capacity retention, um, really compelling rate capability. Um, we've had some new prototype cells over the past year that we've been cycling at pressures uh, below one megapascal, so below about 100 PSI. Um, and one of the things that I, I didn't really touch on this too much before, but we've really been co-designing our electrolyte materials with the process. And what I mean by that is, and coming back to um, the conversation's focal point today, which is polymers, uh, you can imagine various polymers having optimal ways of being processed. And uh, we really have co-designed the polymers to work with the processing equipment. Um, so with that, I will thank you again, Will and, and you for the, the chance to speak today. Um, and I welcome any questions. Kevin, thank you so much for that. Great presentation and always appreciate uh, sharing technical details and there was lots of it. Really, really appreciate it, Kevin. So um, maybe we can begin with just some um, clarifying questions that um, we have received. So you were going a little bit quickly on the, um, the number of uh, electrolytes, catholyte, analyte used in the system. So is it one type or three types uh, used in your cell? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can't share too much about the exact polymers being used, but what I can say is that the sulfide inorganic electrolyte material we're using, uh, we really have focused in on just one material there. Um, it's the polymer that can kind of change between cell components. So this material is used in the composite um, electrodes as well on both sides, just wanna clarify. That's right, yeah. Okay, so you have a single composite for your entire system. Oh, I'm sorry. No, the, 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 the polymer that is within the composite varies between the cell components. It's, it's the oh, okay. the component that's caught between them. Okay, got it, got it. Um, great for that clarification. And the second clarification question was on the first cycle inefficiency. So I think you put there about 80%. Um, so does your energy density calculation already account for that um, inefficient first cycle inefficiency and the extra lithium you have to carry in the cathode? Uh, yes, it does. Um, yeah, the the colomic efficiency brings us down to about 160 to 165 milliamp hours per gram for the specific capacity, and that's essentially what we're using in the energy density calculation. Um, I, I will also say that is something that we are working to improve. Yeah, I think that sort of connects well to the one of the final points you were making, uh, which was the formation. So I presume this 20% expended um, as something to do with parasitic losses in the cell. Uh, but you mentioned that formation is not really required for your cell. So does this process happen very quickly and then you're just done with it? And so it's insensitive to the time and temperature at which this happens? Yeah, I, th I think that, um, you know, the, the truth, Will, is, is that I, th I think formation can't be completely avoided for solid state. 
you have to go and analyze what is the capacity of the cell and, and how does this cell number one compare to cell number two and, and cell number 1000. And, you know, that's just quality control and, and that can't be avoided. Um, the expectation is that um, the formation that we see could, you know, that could occur during that kind of process. We're just not going to have the same extensive formation process that liquid electrolyte cells do, where you're kind of cycling the cell for a couple of weeks and degassing and, and pausing at various SOCs. Um, Great, Kevin. I, I, you know, as someone who works a little bit on formation, I can definitely resonate. Uh, eliminating or shortening it substantially will definitely make your factory a lot smaller uh, sure. for, for making cells. So I think that's a great goal to work towards. Um, Kevin, you highlighted in the sort of the beginning of your talk the importance of safety and appreciate you sharing um, the, the nail puncture test and also for acknowledging that the cell size is a little bit on the smaller side for such a test. But I, I did notice that the, the temperature increase was very negligible, um, which is a little bit surprising to me um, as, as I think you were testing in the fully charged state. Um, can you maybe explain to us a little bit why the temperature didn't go up at all? Yeah, no, great observation, Will. Um, I would say there's, there's two reasons. One is that even though we're at 500 milliamp hours in capacity, um, we do have excess pouch material. You could probably see from the cell that, um, you know, we, we, we're not at the point where we're perfectly pouching materials and, and minimizing the, like the total mass of the pouch yet. So there's a lot of just excess thermal mass that's there. Um, I think the second reason, and, and perhaps more interesting one, um, is that during these safety tests, um, you know, if, if the cell requires high pressure in order for lithium ions to essentially rush from one side of the cell to, to the other, which is what would happen during some sort of short circuit, um, the rate at which uh, internal short circuiting can happen during a safety test is effectively slower. So um, that can just sort of limit how fast the, the cell temperature is gonna rise. Um, we are operating at low pressures, so we don't think that that's gonna significantly impact our test, but that is something to keep in mind when looking at other solid state battery research and, and safety mm -hmm. testing. But I think that the really the short answer is that um, we have a, you know, some extra thermal mass there that's just absorbing a lot of that energy. So mm -hmm. um, the cell temperature just didn't rise as, as high as you'd expect it to. Um, that said, I think that it, one really interesting thing about solid state um, is that you do have the mass of the solid electrolyte there. You effectively have another component inside of the cell that's there to absorb energy and effectively uh, lower how high of a temperature the cell is gonna uh, go to during some sort of event. Um, in a liquid electrolyte cell, you would essentially be vaporizing and losing all of the mass of that liquid. Um, so the temperature of the cell could rise to something like 800 degrees Celsius, at which, at which point you know, the aluminum current collector starts to melt. Um, so in our cells, you have this extra thermal mass that's there to essentially just absorb that energy. Kevin, yeah, I'm very excited and uh, excited to see the testing of larger cells in the future as well. Um, maybe we can, I can have one final, more of a technical question, and then we can go to our um, discussion with Alberto. Um, there was something that also confused me a little bit in the beginning of your talk. Um, you were describing the journey that uh, Blue Current has undertaken, starting with lithium metal and, and end up with this um, um, composite uh, sulfide electrolyte, uh, polymer sulfide electrolyte. And I think you highlighted several cases in which um, you know, pre-existing lithium metal uh, is employed. So I was curious if you guys also looked at um, situation in which the pre-existing lithium metal is very small amount or non-existent in amount um, as a way to not have to deal with um, um, working with lithium in the uh, assembled state of the battery. Yeah, great question. Um, so as a company, we have not really our time working on with lithium metal we, we really didn't pursue things like an anode free approach or working with um you know just a few micrometers of lithium deposit on something um, i should have mentioned the energy density calculation i showed where we were kind of you know plotting anode thickness and, and talking about the impact of lithium metal thickness on the expected energy density um, that really motivates uh, the need for anode free approaches um, having excess lithium metal really is detrimental to the expected energy density. Um, 
So it's it's really critical for companies to and research groups to pursue an anode free approach because otherwise you're still going to have an anode that has a similar thickness to scale the right lithium ion cells today or high silicon content cells like ours. But I guess to answer your question, will um, we didn't ourselves pursue these approaches of using just just a you know much much smaller amount of lithium? I think uh, we just felt like the technique. The techniques that you would use to get to that thin of thickness of lithium uh, would be generally difficult to scale. Uh, we were also just a, a small startup company, and, and um, trying to overcome the hurdle of doing an anode-free approach was, uh, you know, it's, it's it's very challenging to do. Um, our, you know, my hats off to the folks that are pursuing that. So there's been some really exciting work out there on that front. Yeah, agreed. I think the um, the pay um, the payoff is is tremendous if we can get it to work, um, but it's also a very yeah. challenging topic indeed. So, Kevin, I saved a bonus question for you because I'm not sure if you how to what extent you can talk about it. Uh, I think this is the first time that we have heard um, about this uh, polymer sulfide composite approach from Blue Current. Um, you know, I know that a, a lot of these are proprietary, but maybe you can give us a sense of you know, how this sort of gets the best of both worlds. Um, you know, on one hand you have sulfites, on the other hand, you have a polymer electrolyte. Um, we don't need to know the composition, but it'd be great if you can say, you know, for a minute or two, you know, how you landed in this and what's the property that you're aiming for that doesn't come in the end members of the um, polymer and or, uh, or the uh, sulfite by itself. Yeah, so I, um, I should start by saying my, my personal, um, research experience, like even even before joining Blue Current, um, I had worked with polymer electrolytes um, when I was at Berkeley studying under Natasha Balsara. My my PhD thesis was working with um, polyethylene oxide and, and block copolymers with styrene in a lithium sulfur cell. And it, the challenge that everybody faces with polymer electrolytes is just how, you know the, the low ionic conductivity at commercially relevant temperatures. Um, so we knew that if we wanted high rate capability, if we wanted to be able to go and do cycle light testing at C over five and C over three and one C um, and do that at room temperature, that polymer electrolytes themselves may be out of the picture. Uh, we knew that sulfide electrolytes, though they, they did have high ionic conductivity. And, and the other beautiful thing about them is that um, they're very processable at room temperatures. You don't have to go and center them at very high temperatures like you might have to with an oxide. So they're very malleable, they're soft, they can form good interfaces. Um, they also have a really low density. Um, liquid electrolytes have a density around 1.1 to 1.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Sulfide electrolytes, they're typically around uh, 1.8 to 2 grams per cubic centimeter. So um, you're higher in, in, in density, but you're actually not that much higher, especially compared to oxides, which are close to, you know, four to five grams per cubic centimeter. So sulfides have these really, this compelling value proposition of being room temperature processable, high ionic conductivity, um, and they're generally light in weight compared to some other inorganics. But on their own, you would still have this problem where, especially in the presence of active materials that are expanding and contracting, it would be really, you know, um, very, it's very possible to lose contact between the sulfide electrolyte and the active material. So this combination of using polymers with the sulfide electrolyte is essentially what we use to maintain that contact. Um, and I should just verify um, or specify a little bit, Will. Um, as a company, we've pursued a range of different approaches for the polymer. Um, We've done a lot of work developing composites that have a polymer electrolyte as sort of your organic component. We've also done a lot of work developing composites where your organic phase is, is cross-linked. Um, and we've also developed um, composites where they're perhaps more traditional, where your organic phase is, is um, perhaps less intricate and is just there to provide adhesion and, and mechanical flexibility. So we really have sort of a wide range of experience with the, the you know, several different composite approaches, but but that's does that help answer your question? I think it's all about balancing um, the the properties and and um, you know the capabilities of both polymers as well as the inorganic materials. 
I, I, I would say, Kevin, as a material scientist, I would love to have a magical material that does everything. Um, but having two or more components, I think that does substantially expand the degree of freedom for optimization and engineering. So I'm uh, very much a big fan of that. Um, Kevin, I'm just going to make one, one comment, which and then you don't have to respond to it. I, I think just listening to your um, you know, very technically in-depth talk, and I have a sense that you're also using the composite to address the electrochemical stability window of the sulfide solid electrolytes as well on the cathode and anode side. And you know, just for the audience, this is really one of the big challenges with sulfide is it just, it's just not going to work across a four volt window. Uh, and something has to be done to, to really solve that problem. And my guess is, and, and Kevin, I think it's getting to the heart of your technology is that your composite somehow um, can really make the sulfide work for you know a thousand cycles. It's actually impressive with or without pressure. Um, this reactivity is there. Actually, with pressure, it's even worse. Um, so that's uh, very exciting. See, I don't know, Kevin, you want to say anything to that extent, um, but that's at least my observation of the of the innovation. Yeah, no, I, I I love that, Will. Um, <laughs> and you know, the other thing that I'll mention is um, uh, it 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 makes design of the cell a little more challenging in terms of the electrode microstructure, for instance, and then even the separator's microstructure. Um, if you're using a polymer, um, you know, there's a, there's a battle for ion and electron transport that's occurring in the electrodes. And if your polymer is not electrically conductive, then you're gonna block electrical conductivity, right? And, and vice versa. So we had to think carefully about what polymers are we gonna use that'll you know, allow for all of the mass, mass transport to occur in the electrodes. And then you know, in the separator, how do we optimize the mechanical robustness and, and the adhesion and elasticity of the separator film without, for instance, having a polymer that ends up you know, insulating electrolyte particles from each other. So uh, yeah, no, no, great point, Will. Well, Kevin, I think this is a great segue to the panel discussion. I know Alberto is also very fond of uh, mixed ionic and electronic transport and polymers. So it sounds like maybe that's uh, something that you are deploying in your, in your battery technology. So Kevin, thanks for that Q&A. Really appreciate it. And, um, and being frank and direct in addressing all these technical questions, I'm sure uh, folks really appreciate it, especially on the academic side of things. Um, so uh, Alberto, if I can have you up, oh, there you are. So traditionally, we use this time to talk about uh, sort of unifying themes and broader topics um, in connecting the two presentations. And let me just say, uh, what a wonderful um, an hour and a half to learn about all the things polymers can do. Um, you know, now I wish I have studied polymer when I was a graduate student. I feel it's too late, but I'll, maybe I have to take your classes, uh, Alberto, or even working your group even be a better experience, I think. So let me start by just asking this, maybe a very scientific question. What don't we know about polymers, whether it's you know, electronically conducting, ionically conducting, or mixed conducting? What are the fundamental knowledge gaps um, that we still have to address today? Um, maybe I can ask Alberto to weigh in on this first. Yeah, so I mean, for uh, if, if you said, okay, what is the holy grail question in, in my area of electronically or mixed conducting polymers, it's, you know, if, if I'm pitching polymers to a program manager, I will say they're a synthetic semiconductor or mixed conductor. And so I can sort of make whatever molecule I want. But the question is, as long as I know what I want. And the, the vexing problem for us is you have the chemical structure, but that doesn't really tell you what the microstructure will look like. So I showed you quickly, I went quickly through the example of the polymer that has a shorter side chains versus a longer side chains. And if I were to ask someone, which one do you think is going to be more crystalline, I'd get, I'd get like a 50-50 audience of 50% would say one, 50% would say the other. Um, and if you think about it, that's sort of the same fundamental problem of, of the pharma industry. You have a molecule, how will it crystallize? Because it has different structures that are all similar in energy and, and you, you can't really predict the way it's gonna go. So on one hand, I will tell a synthetic chemist, I want a backbone that looks like this and side chains that look like that. And then when I cast a film, I will get a microstructure that is unpredictable and, and, and that will really dominate my properties. And that example that I showed you, I, I was expecting to have a higher capacity with a shorter side chain polymer. 
And I didn't go into the details, but the fascinating aspect of it is that it's less crystalline. So you would think it's easier for ions to go in, but then the ions are counterbalanced by an electronic charge and electronic charge lives more easily in the crystalline parts. And so somehow, because it's a more disordered structure, it actually makes it more difficult to charge, which is completely counterintuitive. So the, the fundamental knowledge gap there is the classical material science issue of understanding structural property relationships in materials where on top of that, sort of the theory and simulation is extremely challenging uh, because some fundamentals are not known. And even if they're known, uh, the energy differences between different structures are small enough that you, you can never assume you're at equilibrium. You don't know where you're gonna be trapped. You process things five different ways, you get five different microstructures. So great for academics. Uh, you know, terrible for technology development. Thanks, Alfred. So I, I think what you're you're saying in a nutshell is it's it's not predictive quite yet in terms of our understanding of structure property relationship. So does this mean that you know a lot of trial and error has to be done in order to make the target material? Um, yeah, absolutely. So the uh, so first of all, yeah, it is not predictive, but I want to. Uh, put in a plug for synthetic chemists, they actually have an amazing intuition. Mm -hmm. So it might not be synthetically predictive, but the best synthetic, uh, sorry, uh, may not be scientifically or quantitatively predictive, but the best synthetic chemists out there, somehow they, they manage to hit in the right molecules and it's not luck, it's really their skill. So often we, on, on the physical sciences side, we lag behind, they, they make a great material like, oh, why is it working so well? Somehow, and I'm telling you, it's not luck. Um, so, so there is that aspect that to me remains to be, uh, remains amazing. This makes me feel a little better, but I always feel like the grass is greener on this side, coming from the inorganic material side, I always feel we don't really, we can't really predict anything. So it's good to hear that uh, on the soft material side, that there's a similar opportunity, I think, for better predictive. Absolutely. <laughs> That's almost great. Kevin, uh, how about you? What, what, what do you think are the fundamental knowledge gap that you wish you know, others would address. I know obviously you're really focused on getting the product out, but you know, there are plenty of people listening here who could be working on the fundamental aspect. Uh, yeah, I would say um, there's, there's a few that come to mind. Um, I think for polymer electrolytes, understanding ionic conductivity, um, you know, under compression, for instance, or, or under, you know, some sort of strain, I think would be really interesting to learn more about, especially as we think about um, electrodes where you have some sort of expansion and contraction of an active material. Um, I think studying more about, you know, ele polymer electrolyte contact with active materials, um, perhaps as SEI layer formation is happening and, and the adhesion between the materials in, in a fully dry environment. Uh, a lot of the work that's been done for silicon today there's so many amazing approaches that, that folks have taken in uh, designing polymers to work with silicon active materials in a liquid electrolyte system. Uh, we just have to wonder how will a lot of these operate in a fully dry system? And what will the material degradation be like? Or what are the mechanical properties of the, the electrode and the polymer over time in a fully dry environment, as opposed to one where there's a liquid electrolyte present that's maybe wetting the polymer? Or, um, so I think that's a, you know, an interesting area for research. I would also say, and this is this is an area where I think there is a lot of, of great work being done, um, understanding the interface between polymer materials and inorganic electrolyte materials, um, figuring out ways to mitigate the resistance growth that happens between polymer electrolytes and inorganic uh, electrolyte materials. Um, I think that that really is going to be an important route to getting those two materials to synergistically work together over long length scales within the battery. So um, I think that's another uh, area for, for more R&D. Thanks, Kevin. Couldn't agree more about the mechanical property. You know, battery is actually, you know, especially in your battery, it's a moving, there's moving parts in the battery. And I, I know, Alberta, you have also been working on sort of the chemo-mechanical relationship in, in polymers. What, what kind of properties do you think will change substantially as a result of these mechanical forces, especially in a constraint cell, right, Kevin, this is, it gets even more serious. Um, so sort of what are the unknowns here in terms of the mechanical property that you want to know, or maybe what Alberta you're working on in terms of understanding? Yeah, I, I would say, um, 
you know, polymer electrolyte, the, the conductivity of, of lithium ions in a polymer is, is reliant on polymer chain mobility and understanding how polymer chain mobility is influenced by uh, whether or not the polymer electrolytes um, under some sort of strain. I think understanding that a little bit more, um, perhaps you start to rely more on the, you know, the hopping of lithium ions from one site to another. Um, you know, and, and you could also start to think about, um, you know, over not just going and doing this on cycle number one, but thinking about how um, the polymer morphology and, and the polymer being, you know, subject to this stress and strain throughout many, many cycles, um, what kind of impact that has on the morphology. And, um, yeah, does that help, Will? Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm just fishing for things to work on. <laughs> um, for us, it's uh, it's uh, you know the, the coupling between uh, when the ions go in and out, uh, you get these changes in in the structure of the unit cell. How does that affect electronic transport? Um, that's that's the one we always think about. And and some of these polymers swell by amazing amounts. And so, okay, you cast a film, you have this beautifully designed and engineered microstructure and then all hell breaks loose because the, the electrolyte streams in and what does that do to electronic transport? Great, um, thank you, Kevin Alberto on that um, discussion about fundamental knowledge gaps. Um, you know, maybe now, you know, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, maybe we can zoom out a little bit. I think both of you alluded to this importance of system level thinking, right? Um, you know, maybe as material scientists, uh, I like to think about, you know, how this material does at the materials level, but, you know, in terms of the technology is not even the battery cell, it's the, it's the battery pack or the battery system at the end that dominates. Um, so Alberto and Kevin, um, maybe you guys can give us a sense, you know, maybe there are some disadvantages um, at the materials level, but there are also advantages uh, that can translate into system level performances that can be obtained anywhere else. Um, you know, Alberto, I think, you know, you mentioned that the graphometric energy capacity um, is, um, is more limited um, in, in the type of polymers you presented, but I assume that, um, you know, the safety would be, would be really great um, and probably same for Kevin as well. Love to learn a little bit about, you know, if we, if we look at the technology at the system level, how does that change our understanding of the requirements for what the polymers must deliver? Instead of just looking at the you know, the numbers for the material by itself. Because when you do it that way, sometimes it doesn't look great. Uh, I'll just give one example for our audience. You know, in the lithium-ion battery industry, you know, people have always thought you need higher energy density cathodes, right? So that's why, you know, nickel manganese cobalt oxide won out. But more recently, people realized that lithium-ion phosphate is really safe. Oxygen doesn't come out, although the energy density at the material level 30% lower. It's now found in 50% of the Tesla Model 3 vehicles. So that's a good example of how system level thinking really dominates um, at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree, Will. It's been amazing to watch sort of like the, the re-rise of LFP over the, the past uh, couple of years. Um, I, you know, um, in a lot of ways, you know, we, we've always had this goal of making an inherently safe cell. And um, what's happening with LFP is, is what, you know, people are kind of taking, if, if LFP is, is much safer, um, then at a pack level, at a system level, um, you can pack cells closer together. And as a result, have a system level energy density that actually is comparable um, to an NMC or an NCA based cell pack. Um, we feel similarly with fully dry solid state cells. Um, and in some ways, that kind of gives us a platform to innovate on. If, if you were to take a step back and say, okay, well, maybe solid state fully dry right now, it's only delivering seven to 800 watt hours per liter at the cell level. Well, the truth is when you go to the system level like LFP, it can actually deliver a system level energy density that's higher than uh, liquid electrolyte cells can, can achieve today because of that apparent safety. So um, I think that thinking that way, thinking about the end product and, and like the consumer's experience and, and safety um, gives you some flexibility in terms of designing 
just trying to design a material set that is inherently safe and, and uh, projecting that to system level energy density gains. Kevin, here's a, a sort of a million or billion dollar question for you. How high do you think your volumetric utilization would be at the pack level? You know, it's about 55% now for today's lithium ion, about maybe 70% for lithium ion phosphate based cell. I mean, if you have a truly intrinsically safe, I'd imagine that number can even be higher at the pack level. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I am hesitant to give you any numbers because pack development is is really, really a complicated thing. And I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but in the modules that we designed for our, our calculation, we didn't actually include heat transfer, um, a, you know, thermal management system. And, and that's going to have some sort of impact um, on the overall system level energy density. So as much as I would like to just take the numbers that I showed there and say that that's kind of what we're, we're striving for. The truth is I think that once you go and try to design an entire pack, there's a lot of sort of components that come, come into place. But um, that said, I do think that the inherent safety and, and just sort of like the promise of the materials at a, at a material level will allow cells to be packed more closely together. And I think that the volumetric efficiency can be higher, but it's hard to even exact number. Well, Kevin, I, I completely agree that if you can get rid of pressure and make it intrinsically safe, I think that would translate into phenomenal uh, pack level energy density. Um, so very excited to see where your trajectory goes in terms of the, um, the pressure aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, Alberto, how about in the area of um, you know, um, low cost um, energy storage, um, can you comment a little bit on what kind of system level consideration motivates your work um, and, and how that might map and turn into a disadvantage of a material into an advantage at the systems level. Yeah, so um, I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer. I'll tell you why, because this, this has really been a desire for personal growth on my side. Um, so I come from the world of organic electronics where we always work with materials that are less performing than uh, the conventional counterparts. And so we're always thinking of, you know, what is the systems level advantage when you think of an organic solar cells? It could be maybe building integrated PV or something like that. And so I'm, I'm new to the world of energy storage, so I haven't put a lot of thought, but if I have to give one, one thought that I have, it, it is that finding these system level advantages is actually pretty difficult to, you have to be, you have to really know the industry quite well to, to not say something completely stupid in, in, that, in that field. If you go back to solar cells, when we started, I remember some people used to say, well, if you if the solar cell has a 3% efficiency, but it's nearly free, then yeah, it will have a market. That turns out to be completely wrong because you still have to install it on the roof and so on. So you know, for me, this is a great forum. Uh, I, I can't say myself, what is the system level advantage of what we've been looking at because like I said it's something I'd like to understand better so if someone actually can can um, help me guide guide me in the right direction that would be immensely helpful. Well bro thanks for that honest answer yeah this is something else I've been thinking a lot about uh, to sort of put uh, fundamental innovations in context of the big um, technology. And, and maybe we can segue into this final point um, I would like to to get your inputs and insights on is scale, right? Um, you know, it's, it's agreed upon now, we need to deploy, you know, hundreds of terawatt hours of energy storage um, to propel us um, through this energy transition, which of course is motivating all of our work in academia and industry. Um, one thing that I don't fully understand is, Kevin, you talked about the processability of the material at your factory, Right, but you know, at some point, someone has to make all the polymers to begin with as well. Um, what does that look like? And you know, obviously, polymers are a huge industry already, uh, so certainly scaling, I think, is not an issue. But how about your carbon footprint? And you know, how does one benchmark against some of the inorganic um, variants? And Alberto, you brought up a great example of solar cells, right? So you know, if today the performances were more similar between inorganic and organic, how does the environmental footprint compare? How does the scalability and the manufacturability, you know, starting from the mines. Um, how does that compare? I, I think that's also another way of looking at the system is the entire value chain from, you know, mines and of course, including all the way to recycling as well. So I think this may be a good point for us to end on. Uh, I don't know, if maybe Kevin, you wanna take a shot at that first? 
Yeah, well, I, I would start by saying that as we are starting to scale as a company, we are doing all of those calculations and making sure that as best as possible, we do this in a way that is best for the environment. Um, what's interesting with the inorganic electrolyte materials is that it's not completely different than going and making some sort of lithium salt. I mean, it obviously depends on the composition, but um, a lot of the, the methods that you would use for making an inorganic electrolyte are, have similar energy requirements um, compared to producing a lithium salt. That said, I think that for the inorganic electrolytes, there's a pretty substantial difference comparing sulfides to something like an oxide in terms of what temperatures, what temperatures are required during the actual processing. Mm -hmm. Another reason why we are you know, so excited about sulfide electrolytes is because uh, yeah, there was an interesting paper on this. I'm going to have to find the reference. Um, you know, processing a cell with sulfide electrolyte consumes about two times less energy than if you're uh, processing a cell with an oxide. Um, mm -hmm. That's because you're not going and doing high temperature sintering during the manufacturing process. So mm -hmm. we think that sulfides are actually particularly important in having manufacturing facilities that are, you know, uh, sustainable and, and comparable in, in energy usage to lithium ion today. But great question, Will, and that's something that we really are looking into as we're starting to scale. Kevin, I really resonate with this thermal budget problem. You know, as a, a person who works with um, you know high temperature process materials, um, it's really amazing to see how much energy can go into just running those big kilns. Uh, for firing, and you know, if, if you overlay all the announced battery factory, you can actually see kind of a emergence of your, um, I would say, uh, uh, hydro belt right in the north in Canada and the Nordic. And you will also, I think, in the next 25 years, also see sort of the sun belt as well, where solar prevails uh, to have that inexpensive electricity. But I think a little bit of the unfortunate thing is we're turning those very valuable electricity into heat, uh, which is maybe, you know, if you take our birds of thermodynamic class, is not your best approach. Um, but completely agree on the thermal budget. Uh, yeah. I think that's something that I think the polymer can really tackle. Um, Alberto, what do you think about this so, uh, scalability? So, so, we're, so, so, you know, for us, the challenge is still figuring out what are the right materials. But people have started doing these, LC, having these LCA considerations now in our field. And so I don't know that anyone's figured out exactly um, how it's going to go. But here, the positives are people are looking at more um, higher yield reactions and greener ways of doing the chemistry. And then uh, most of the materials have earth abundant elements. So there's that. And then the thermal budget that you mentioned, everything is low temperature. Um, that was a big one for solar cells. Uh, the energy payback time for organic solar cells was calculated to be a lot, a lot lower. So that, that makes the proposition more attractive, even if your efficiency is not as high. So it, it's, it's a field that's still in its infancy. Um, and I agree with you, it's a great point and people are realizing it now. And so you'll see more and more proposals of people not only saying that they want to make the highest performing material, but they want to develop the greenest chemistry as well. In fact, that's what Adam in our joint effort is trying to do. Well, this is an amazing vision, I think. Um, best of luck to, to both of you on, uh, on realizing that vision. Um, Kevin, uh, thank you so much for sharing all the technical details. Um, and performance data, really appreciate it. Alberto, thank you for sharing all the fundamental excitements around um, ionically, electronically, and mixed conducting polymers. And you know, maybe the two of you should get together <laughs> uh, and to find in interesting intersections. So um, on that note, I really like to thank both of you for getting up early in the morning today um, to speak to um, um, our audience and myself. Really deeply appreciate it. So this, as I mentioned, concludes our uh, spring series of the StorageX seminar, and soon we'll announce uh, the summer series as well. So please uh, uh, check our website periodically and for our mailing uh, email announcements uh, for the next set of um, seminars. I'd like to, again, thank everyone for joining us for this very exciting quarter. Um, the energy storage industry is moving at a tremendous pace, um, and I think I hope that this uh, forum has been a good one uh, to give you insights of the latest and greatest, uh, both in academia and in industry. And please stay connected with us uh, on LinkedIn on our website. If you're interested, we also have a number of excellent uh, educational uh, programs that you can uh, participate at Stanford. And with that, thanks everyone and have a great summer.